every photograph that you edit has its own unique issues and its own solutions. And usually those solutions are can be many. Um, so the first thing that you're going to do when you decide on a, um, a work to do, and this is my painting that I did several years ago. Um, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to duplicate your photograph before you do any editing at all. And you're going to go to the bottom. If you have an a, a iPhone with you, you might want to follow along so you can take a look at where things are. So at the very bottom of the page on, and on the iPhone, it's on mine, it's the bottom left corner. I'm using um, an iPhone 8. Um, my husband has a 12 and I did some of the same edits on his and everything seemed to be pretty much the same. Um, and so you're going to hit that button. And then the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to go, you're going to drop down to um, this list and you're going to hit duplicate. And for editing, this is a really great thing to do because what will happen is you are going to make, um, you may make several edits that you really like and you don't really want to lose. You want to keep that copy. So you can stop editing and do this process and duplicate that that image at that time so you can have it. So this way you can compare which ones you like better, right? It's really important. Also, it's you can over time, if you're doing a lot of edits and you keep hitting the word done, you're going to eventually lose your original. So that's the main reason for the duplicating. Okay, and now I, I did duplicate and here is my duplicate. Now this painting has a bunch of issues. Um, let's say I wanna show this on Instagram. I don't really wanna show it on my, on my, um, on Instagram on the easel. I just want to, to cut that into that. So that's gonna be my goal today is to just isolate the painting and also straighten it up and also improve the color. So we're gonna see if I can get through all that pretty quickly. But first, let's take a little tour of the program and I am hitting edit. I don't know if you see that. Um, okay, now you're seeing my whole screen. Okay, so how, how these edits work, if we start at the bottom of the page, um, you see we have cancel and then there are three little icons and then there's the word done. So the first one here is has a little yellow dot underneath and that highlights these edits right here. There are 15 wonderful edits that are just so wonderful. You know, years ago you could only do this on your computer. And there's um, some, some edits here that I like. Um, even more so than my Photoshop program because I can do it so much faster. So we're gonna talk about these. Um, we're gonna do our editing and that. Then there's this next button, which is sort of does a, and I can just hit on these while I do it so you could see that these are all um, pre, pre-screened, pre-organized for specific types of editing. And um, my favorite is the last one, the NOR. So I have used that one. Um, sometimes I actually do hit on a very good editing of a piece, but I find most of the time I prefer, I prefer the um, going through it individually. This is actually uh, this original one. Yeah, well, that's it. That was the point I had to make. All right, now let's move on to the next button. Uh, wait, 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 and wait, 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 just want to get here. So how you get out of this is you press, you can press it on the bottom or you move over. And so here is, now this is some of my favorite features on the iPhone. The, this one is, um, these all have to do with positioning the piece. So you have this one is the straighten or crookeding, whichever one way you want to go. This one will, this one and the next one are both about tilting. 
tilting things forward or back. And I'll do show you over here on this one, tilting it this way, tilting it this way. So this feature is really terrific if you are shooting a room and you want to emphasize one wall over another. Um, it's also, it's these, I use a lot of these edits for when I take um, landscape imagery. Um, this one is also really useful, especially in, in straightening out pictures. So if your picture is, is keystone, you can use this to straighten out the keystone. Uh, for this picture here today, we're gonna actually use all three of these edits to get this picture nice and straight. So we'll do that in a little bit, but let me continue my tour. Up on top here, we have, um, this is on the top. I, oh, I can use my cursor. On the top right over here is the button that will flip. So, you know, I'm using, um, um, I have my computer, but I'm working this all through my phone. So I get confused whether I can use my, <laughs> I'm getting, my hands are all confused basically what I should, where my hand should be. Okay, so I could use this to, to flip the picture and back. The one next to it will go around and we'll turn it that way. And this one over here features lots of different sizes that you can turn. Now, some of these sizes are on the bottom here, you'll notice that you have free form where you can move it and you can move the square in any way. And I'm gonna put it back to where it belonged, go back to original. Uh, fit it in there. And then you have square. So you have these nice pre-settings on the bottom, which could be really helpful if you need to um, uh, make something into a particular size for whatever reason. And um, move over here back to the original. And this last one up here is lots of fun. These three little dots will open up other programs. And I have just started using this. I didn't even realize this was here. And this is markup. And markup will give you on the bottom a whole bunch of of palettes and things so that you can pick colors and types of, types of, um, go back down, let's see, so get out of colors. And also you can make all kinds of line sh shapes with this. So you could pick your line, pick your color, and there you go. You could be painting on top of your, your work, which is just a fun thing, so. Just if you hadn't known about that, it's fun. Uh oh, and I think I left some marks on there. <laughs> All right, so how do I how do I undo that? Let's see. Um, how I undo that? It's not letting me. Let's see. Discard changes. All right. Oh, that was just dirt on my phone. Excuse me. All right, <laughs> back to my back to our picture. All right, so now let's start, now that we did the tour, let's start editing it. And we're going to start with um, this line of 15 edits. This first one here is um, the magic wand, which will pick what it believes is the best for your picture. And you can adjust it in contrast by going back and forth. For this particular painting that actually um, looks pretty good. So um, and but you know what I think we'll do? Let's let's edit the size first and then get back to that. So to change the size and bring it up because that'll make editing it easier. We go to the bottom over here and you see it lit up and we're going to go through a process of of straightening this out. Now you'll see when I get close to this, that it is not square. So you have some space there and you have some space here. It's keystoned. So to change that, that keystoning, we're going to move to this button here. 
And I'm going to slowly move it up so that it is straightened out. Now the bottom is still a little crooked. And if I bring this up to, to, to it here, let's see. There's a little bit of space there. Do you see that? Now I can correct that little bit of space also by, um, by using the same button going the other way and seeing if we could push, just move the bottom down a little bit. See that, how it's moving it down? Now I have on the, when I do that though, I still have some space on the side and I can use this button to help me, now the last button here, to straighten out it on the sides by turning it a little bit, turning it a little bit this way. And then going back and coming down a little. So I'm trying to finesse it to get that in so I don't lose too much of my canvas. Because you could just crop it, but then you're losing some of your canvas. So this is the, the finessing part of using these in terms of cropping it. I don't want the size to change. All right, that's pretty good for now. I didn't lose too much of my canvas. So you can play with the, all three of these. And then here I can also straighten it out a little. It's a little crooked. And I am done with that portion. Oops, let's go back. I'm done with that for now. And you can see I have the revert. Now, if I hit revert now, I'm going to have a choice of going back to the original. Right now, what I could do right now is say, you know what, I just want to save this the way it is. And I'm going to hit cancel. And I'm going to go to that little box. You know, I don't, I, I don't know if you're seeing the little box on, on the bottom. Nope, that doesn't show up. But I am moving now to duplicate this stage. And, and that's what I just did. I just duplicated it. And now I'm going to go back and edit some more. So I have a copy of this now. Um, and now I'm going to start by editing the, the color. And so I'm going to start over here. We, we looked at the, the magic wand. Let's go to the first button over here. And this is exposure. And exposure is just like your camera. I see there's a little bit of the easel still left in there. So I'm going to probably eventually go back in there and crop that a bit more. And so exposure is interesting in that it will take the entire picture and make the entire thing uh, either lighter or darker. And sometimes that's not a great edit because you, you kind of are losing intensity of, in color. For example, here, here's exposure. And I'm going to move over to right over here to brightness. Now look at how brightness is different in changing tone from exposure. You see, you still have the color. It's getting lighter, but you still have the color. It's getting darker, but you still have the color changes. So each one of these are really very particular in how you make the edits. Um, this next one here is Brilliance, which is a great one to use. It also works in a light and dark pattern, but it really preserves the color. Um, there's another one called Vibrance. Um, and kind of a lot of these sort of have pairs of things that are similar. Here, this is vibrance compared to brilliance. So it's subtle. This one uh, works all, um, similar to the one next to it, which is called saturation, but it just preserves the color a bit more. So let me go back to the beginning here. I just wanted to show you that there are these that are similar in here that, that you know, to, to figure out which ones to do, you know, you have to become a little familiar with them. This one is highlights and you can see how it is, um, how here now I've, I've emphasized the light areas by going negative in the highlight area. Now, you notice that it's turned white, 
the ring turns white when I go negative, and when I go positive, it turns yellow. Well, let's leave, let's leave these highlights right here like that. I like that feature. Now let's move to another one, and it's, and it's going to be a record of what I've done, which is really great. You can look back at this, and let's see what we could do with shadows. And shadows are going to, I'm trying to make these shadows a little deeper in the mountains. This is a painting of flying over the Cascade Mountains um, on my frequent trips to Seattle. And here's contrast. Now you see, I'm also working with the contrast. Contrast is really interesting because it softens, which you wouldn't think of contrast in a softening way, but look how wonderfully soft that gets in the negative. And in the, uh, and in the other direction, it deepen, deepens and hardens edges. So that's an interesting quality of contrast of which way to go with this. Do I want to go strong like that or soft like this? Oh, I kind of like the softness. Hey, Are Pearl. I ever going too slow? Well, this is great, but we <clears throat> we have two more presenters and we okay. want them to have All right, time. I'm just so go can you quickly. go through quick and wrap it up? Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Fran, Fran knows I get too detailed. <laughs> uh, so here is black point, which will emphasize just those deep dark colors. Saturation is color, more color or no color. And vibrance we talked about. Um, warmth is actually changes in, right, in warmth, in um, warm colors or cool colors. So you, you have the whole spectrum in warmth. And this is tint, which is sort of a green, purpley, blue kind of thing that it has. Uh, sharpness, which this painting could definitely use, especially because we've cropped it. And whenever you make something smaller, it's going to get be have less less definition and sharpness. And I'm just and there's noise reduction. We could do that. And this is vignette. And that's it. That's my tour. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. Pearl. You're welcome. Great. Yeah, so I'm um, done. How did you okay. duplicate the image? I'm sorry. I just wanted to. How did you duplicate the image? Oh, you see that? Okay. Let's quickly do that. Let me go back to here. Whoops. So you go to, let me go to beginning my thing so you can see it. You have to go to that little mark at the bottom. Okay. Put the angle, I and know. then then slide down to duplicate. Okay. And and it will show up right next to your the your original. Okay. Thank you. And, and so when you change them, they're all lined up next to one another, and that makes it really easy to see your changes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Go Great. Ahead. Thank you so much, and, Pearl. Sure. Um. Excellent. Um, so, um, next we have Audrey Anastasi. For me, in general, um, the issue is glare. And um, uh, this is an example of glare at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you, you can back up, uh, Eileen, to the one that has the example of glare. You were just there. What the hell? Does she have to go back? Uh, you're going the wrong direction. Here we go. Well, there. Okay, let's let's start with this as an example of glare. Wait a second. Oh, just do you want to stay there? Sorry. <laughs> okay, Audrey. All right. Oh. Um, Was it this one? Yeah. Let's start with that. That's a good okay. idea. Okay. So, in general, um, with oil paintings. Glare is a problem because what happens is, as you can see on the upper right, each piece of um, uh, each part of the weave of the, of the canvas can pick up a highlight. So if you look at the left side of that picture, you can see that it's brown. On the right side, it's the exact same brown, but it doesn't look like brown. It just looks light. And this is a problem that a lot of 
artists have when they try to photograph their own work. Um, at the gallery and often for other people, we will set up with polarizing filters, which can eliminate that. Uh, that uh, influences the direction of the light that's being shined onto the piece. And I know Michael is gonna get into uh, the general setup. If you use a polarizing filter uh, on, the, on the light source and on the camera, you can dial out that glare. So by literally turning the filter, you, and looking through the camera, you will see all that um, sort of sp sparkly stuff on the right side disappear. Now, many of us are photographing with our phones. And so glare is still an issue, but you don't have the luxury of using uh, polarizing filters. So now we can go to another image and I'll show you what I've learned as a good way to get around that. Okay, so. Which one, I'm sorry. Try, uh, this is an example of glare. You can see it at the bottom. And this is on a panel painting. You can just kind of zip through it quickly and then we'll get to the next one. This is the same. <laughs> is that what you wanted? Um, the, the, the original sequence is fine, but no, we need to show glare first. <laughs> Okay, stop. <laughs> so that shows glare, which is very typical when you're shooting with your iPhone. And it, it go on to another one now. So one of the ways around. Well, this was the order you I had. Thought I, I thought I gave you a sequence. Glare first. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't but... matter. Keep okay. going. Yeah. Okay, so oh. one of the ways you can, that's the same exact picture, but by photographing it at an angle, I have minimized the glare. There's a little bit of glare in the lower left part of the image. You can see that the contrast is not as good, but I'm gonna sacrifice that because in general, the image is pretty good in terms of not having glare. But what I've done is I have intentionally keystoned it to get rid of the glare. And then I would go to the same uh, uh, features that, that, that Pearl was just speaking about to write the image. And I'm actually gonna add on to something that, that Pearl said when she was, uh, when she was, you can go to the next one, that's fine. When she was modifying hers, she cropped in very tightly. I don't do that. I would keep a lot of that space still around it and go back and forth to the different mm -hmm. Uh, controls that are in the bottom. So yeah. what I've done is I've circled at the top to make sure the image uh, is, is in the correct orientation. That's number one. Number two is the tilt of the image. Number three is the keystoning top to bottom. And number four is keystoning right to left. And you reach all of those features on one page with the arrow at the bottom, which is basically your cropping tool. Right. But if you crop in too closely in the beginning, you're gonna end up losing part of your image. I think right. now we can go on to the next one. Oops. Yeah. Which is, I, <laughs> I just wanna show the finished one. Okay. Go back. Well, I... the, uh, no, there is one, there it is, there it is finished. So I've sacrificed very little. You can see in every corner, there's a teeny, teeny bit of green because this has rounded edges and I haven't lost anything. I've been able to come in with my crop very, very close. Um, and, and that's basically it. So this is a decent image to post made from an iPhone with almost no glare. Any questions? Mm -hmm. um no that was that was good I, mean, I wish i had i wish i had had listened to you uh, two days ago when i was trying to photograph my work for the knife I, that was exactly my problem and i <laughs> i didn't know how to deal with it but thank you very helpful you're welcome uh, 
I that, that's wondering. the most common that's the most common difficulty that people have photographing their own work they often don't have it evenly lit and even right. even very very professional lighting at the 45 degree angles if you have a shiny painting or a painting with a lot of black in it you will get a haze and if you try to correct that later on by you by intensifying saturation, you're going to get an unnatural looking image when it comes time to post it. I, I really think it's important that what you post has some uh, indication of what the actual physical object is like. We were talking about this last night on Michael's um, uh, salon, and that is when you're looking at an image of artwork on a screen, it's more like looking at stained glass. You're looking at an image formed by light emanating from it. It's very different than looking at a physical object. So looking at this last image, you can kind of get a sense of um, what the, the painting is without being over exaggerated. You do want to make it appealing. So you might want to take a little bit of liberty, but I think you have to be very, very light handed, whether you're using Photoshop uh, from a proper computer or whether you're using the, the editing on the iPhone to try to remain true. And one of the things about using the iPhone is usually your piece is right next to you and you can look back and forth. So Audrey, that's, that's a really good point. I just wanted to read something that Gail Rothstein said uh, in the text. She says, I would suggest that everyone be careful not to edit your images to the point that they do not accurately represent the reality of your artwork. This can be a serious issue if your piece is accepted into a show based on a photo submission. And she's right, it would not look professional at all if you sent in a piece that, that looked, you know, quite different than than the image so you do have to be careful when you're uh, doing your edits yeah i i also wanted to say thank you audrey and it's great the idea of twisting yeah. your uh piece while you're yeah. taking the photo i would also recommend tilting it down like slightly like one or two degrees at the same time you could twist and and tilt right. because when you take that photo, that's a trick of getting rid of glare very quickly to tilt it towards you. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you showed so easily, it can be changed, you know, with the keystoning, with the editing, so. Right, what, what I've found with that, um, it, it depends where your light source is. I've done all of those different directions just to get rid of the glare first, and then you have that wonderful option to put it all back into square Mm -hmm. because you have those editing options. If you're on Photoshop on a computer, uh, there's something called perspective and you can put mm -hmm. things back into square using that. But right. we're talking about, you know, doing this kind of on the fly for Instagram and uh, it's, it's surprising how good it works. It, it is so surprising. surprising. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask uh, Audrey, Audrey, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, it sounds like you're saying you only use this tilting method to get rid of the glare. You don't use any of the other tools that um, Pearl showed us, you know, I, the lighting, the uh, filters and stuff. Sure, I, I could use that, but not, I don't really need that very much. For, uh, you for know, glare, I'll, you don't have to. No, because I, uh, you're better off starting with a decent image. You, you're just better off starting without the problems. And such a, since it's yeah, an yeah. easy fix to tilt it, it's like magic. Mm -hmm. when, when I photograph large paintings, again, either for myself or for other people at the gallery, the, the longest part of the process is setting up the lighting, making sure that it's even at every corner using possibly a light meter. Uh, my, my eyeballing it, I never look at the actual artwork. I look at the wall around it. If the if the wall above and below and to the right and the left are the same gray tone, I know I've got the piece fairly evenly lit. But then the next thing is to get rid of the glare or to make sure you don't have glare when you have that lighting. 
So that's where polarizing filters come in and they're a very easy fix for that in general, but that's, that's the time consuming part setting up and then just snapping the picture is not a big deal and you need very little Photoshop afterwards. Can I say something? Uh, yes, and then we'll get on to our next presenter. Go ahead. Uh, oh, you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, thank you, Audrey, for, for that presentation. That's great. I actually didn't know that. So thanks for add, adding to my repertoire. And you're absolutely right about the space around the piece. I was sort of trying to do things a little quicker. And I had two, I had a few pieces set up as examples to show, I mean, that the cropping, if you just use the, the main crop thing and you just come in and you, and you cut away the edges, you really are changing the size of your piece. And by doing the finessing of, of, the, of pulling the sides and then slowly cropping it, you really can preserve most of your picture. It's a really important thing, you know, and I had two examples shown of just cropped and cropped with the finessing. So. Well, that, that's true. And yeah. it, it, you really wouldn't have much of a glare issue unless you had to say photograph something under glass. That might be a way to get around that rather than take something out of the glass. Uh, but yeah. but if, think, if, you, yeah. if you have matte work, if right. you have works on paper, for instance, yeah. you aren't going to have the same glare issues. Yeah, but just in terms of cropping, I'm talking about not, ne okay. not necessarily the glare. Just I think just I think crop cropping. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, I think we need to move on because Mike yes. uh, Krasowitz um, is also going to share. Thank you so much, Pearl and Thank Audrey. You. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you. I have a few, a few things to share on the glare thing. Um, sometimes I, I photograph work that has glass. And what I do is I, I have a big um, black velvet curtain. And what I do is I take the big velvet, black velvet curtain, I cut a hole in it, and I put the camera through the hole. And then I light my lights. Instead of going at 45 degrees that they normally do, I turn them almost like this sideways with umbrellas going towards the camera. It makes a very diffused light. The reflection reflects off of the black velvet and you don't get these, you don't get the mm -hmm. reflections. Yeah. So there are tricks I, and I have a whole bunch of things, but um, you got, can you yeah. share my, do I have to share screen? Uh, yes, you can share screen. Velvet. So um, this is your basic, before I go into what I do with the Android, this is your basic lighting setup. Basically, if you're photographing artwork, you have two lights at 45 degrees to the artwork and then your camera in the center. Um, the distance the lights go to the, to the, to the uh, artwork depends on the size of the artwork. You know, if the lights are too close, you're gonna have fall off on the top and bottom and things like that. So you determine your light distance that way. Um, you can see here that they have different, different lights. The first one in the top left, it looks like a continuous light going through an umbrella. The person on the top right is using soft boxes. The quality of the light is important because a diffused light source versus a, a direct light source can have an effect on those spectral reflections that you're seeing in the reflections. So when she's talking about those specular highlights, that has something to do with, with the direction of the light. And I, I brought up a slide for that. And this is a, a thing in photography that people, it's like one of the first things you learn. The angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So if your light source is coming towards the object directly at 90 degrees, it's gonna reflect 90 degrees. So you're gonna get that respectful reflection coming right off the object. Whether, it's, whether you're photographing sculpture or something like that, you've gotta think about that light that's coming in and, and where the reflection is. So if the light is coming at an angle, it'll reflect off at an angle. So that's just something to think about when you're lighting. Um, Another thing I want to just mention is when you're using a phone, for the most part, a phone has a wide angle lens. A wide angle lens tends to be more distorted on the edges than towards the center. Mm -hmm. So if you want to take a photograph of, with your phone, your best bet is to use the center of the, of the image, not towards the edges. 
because when you go towards the edges, I think I have an image. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to try not to repeat some of the things that every people put outside, but but basically, when you go towards the edges, it gets more distorted. Mm -hmm. So if you use the center part of the image, you're going to have less distortion. And when you crop, you'll see it. You won't have as much issues with the with the distortion. Also, lenses can will have these other distortions. They can be like a barrel distortion or a pin cushion distortion. To minimize that, use the center of the image and you won't have to worry about that so much. But what do you mean by use the center of the image? In other words, if you have a, a camera that's a, like that's like horizontal format like this, just use the center part of the camera itself. I'll, I'll show you a picture. I, I, I have lots of- you know, I, I gotta tell you, space. I'm gonna buy an iPhone because iPhones are awesome. But but Michael, Mike, what you're saying is when you take the photo, have air around it so it's more central in the center of the camera. Right. So you avoid that pin cushion or barrel distortion. Right. So if I shoot something, I'm trying to find an image that I shot. I'll try to keep it towards the center of the frame. I'm sorry about the reflection, but you can see. I just won't use the top part and the bottom part because that's where the most distortion is in a wide angle lens. So you won't try to take a large image of the painting. You'll leave a lot of space around it. Right, because that's, that's going to make it more square. the camera. Uh -huh. uh, that'll make it more square. And then okay. when I shoot it, I, I'm very careful. If I, you know, I'll use that clip that everybody has and I'll use that clip to hold the camera and I'll try to make it very square before. So because you don't want to do too many of these corrections. Every time you're doing a correction, you're changing the image a little bit. So like if I photograph with my regular camera, if I shoot with this camera and I'm photographing work, I use this lens. This is a, a, a flat field lens, which means the lens itself, the curve, there's no curve on the, on the elements of the lens. So when you photograph, you're photographing flat. So you're not going, getting into this like distortion thing. It's a great feature to be able to correct these things. But you are kind of altering the image a little bit. Every time you're doing something, you're correcting it a little bit. And even when you when you're changing the color or the contrast or anything like that, you're manipulating mm -hmm. the image to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is the metering. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll take a picture with the camera and it'll be too light or it'll be too dark. And the reason for that is because there's a there's a meter inside the camera, and that's what's called a reflected meter. And what that's doing is the light is reflecting off the object and reflecting back into the camera. And that is trying, that meter is trying to determine a middle gray, uh, averaging all the stuff it sees in the picture, it makes a middle gray and it takes the picture. I'm sorry guys, I'm terrible public speaking. So if I'm- No, oh, you're doing great. Um, so, so sometimes the image will come out too light or the, sometimes the image will come out too dark compared to what you're looking at. That's because there's a reflective meter. So you'll see with photographers, they'll have this thing called an incident meter, which is the light falling on the object. And if you take a meter reading at the, at the object, you're getting an actual reading of the light hitting the object. So it's giving you a correct exposure. That being said, photographing artwork is always a little tricky. It always tends to come out with my experience a little bit lighter, even if you're using an incident meter. So I'll tend to underexpose what the meter says. So if the meter says F8, I'll do like F11, or I'll do a couple of different ones, and then I can bring them up and, and then I can compare. Because then you're gonna compare it to your actual picture. And you wanna kind of make it as close as you can to the, to the, to the actual picture. Um, there was mention about color temperature. Color temperature relates to the color temperature of the object that's lighting the subject. So if you're, if you're in daylight, it's based on degrees Kelvin. And just in general, daylight is 5,500 degrees Kelvin. Old tungsten lights is 3,400 degrees tungsten, uh, Kelvin. And that will warm or cool your picture, depending on your light source. So sometimes somebody just mentioned in, in one of the questions about that their paper turns out blue. And the reason the paper turns out blue is there are two things that are happening. One is that um, because it's a generally a white subject and the meter, the reflective meter wants to make it gray, mm -hmm. it's going to underexpose the paper. So it's going to try and that's going to turn that white paper gray. Mm -hmm. It's going to turn a dark object, a black object gray. 
So if you're photographing sculpture, you got to kind of play around with your exposure a little bit to find the right exposure. And the same thing with works on paper. If, if it's, you might brighten it before you take the picture and that will give you a, a white paper. And then you might correct for the color because the color is the color temperature gets mixed up a little bit. But it tends to go blue because you're underexposing, which means it needs more exposure, needs more light.